Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, November 27, 2022. This is Deacon Barry Taylor, and we are in Lesson 13 uh, of Unit 3, our Fall Quarter, from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. This is the last lesson in our Fall Quarter, or Unit 3. And that unit, as you recall, is entitled we are God's artwork. We are God's artwork. Our lesson title is Tools Available to Withstand Injustice and Evil from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Devotional reading is taken from Psalm 91 or is Psalm 91. Our background scripture, Revelations 2 verses 1 to 7. Acts 19 and Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 24. Our printed passage or lesson text is Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18. And our key verse from the KJV is Ephesians 6 13 which reads, Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand the in the evil day and having done all to stand our lesson aims from the quarterly or number one recognize the need for christians to stand firm in god number two value wearing the spiritual armor of god as protection in a world of oppression and injustice and number two, three use God's tools to promote a more just and peaceful world. And after the introduction, um, the lesson has two divisions. The first is entitled, Know Your Enemy, and that's covered between Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 12, and the second is, use the proper tools and that's covered between Ephesians 6 verses 13 and 18 from the standard commentary the lesson title is God gives tools for our protection and additional aims are number one list elements of the armor of God number two distinguish between offensive and defensive elements of that armor and number three make a plan to use one of those elements more effectively now before we get into a little background or context for today's lesson let's go before the throne our father we do thank and praise you lord for every good and every perfect gift lord we thank you for always for the opportunity to study your precious word and lord we we certainly thank you for uh, what you have provided for us in the way of armor lord the equipment that we need to withstand uh, the evil the wiles of satan lord and mm -hmm. uh, and the evil that he uh, intends uh, for our lives and all those who place their trust in you lord we thank you for all the spiritual blessings that you've given us all the spiritual gifts and we pray that you'd help us to apprehend them lord and to use them effectively lord for our protection lord and for your glory uh, lord we ask that you would bless all those who uh, are, are hearing this lesson bless the households represented in jesus name amen now, our lesson today is taken from the epistle or letter to the Ephesians. Uh, and as we, I believe we've discussed uh, before in this quarter, um, the letter, while addressed to Ephesus, the city uh, Ephesus, uh, was not intended for a particular church only, but all those in the... Asia Minor area, what's known as Turkey now, is intended to be circulated uh, throughout Asia Minor. And it doesn't address any specific problem that the church is having, uh, those churches in the region, but it uh, addresses uh, certainly principles in the first half of the, the, the letter. Paul 
addresses the doctrine, doctrine, Christian doctrine, and then the second half, how to to actually uh, uh, live out, if you will, uh, the principles that he espouses in the first half. Uh, this is one of the four prison epistles uh, that was written sometime between uh, AD 61 and 62 while Paul was a prisoner in Rome. Uh, and Paul um, is acutely aware of, uh, and as, as were I'm sure most people of his day, of the um, armor, if you will, or the attire of the typical Roman soldiers. Uh, the Ro Rome had garrisons in all of the, the cities of the provinces that they controlled. And so what Paul is going to use um, as an example of the armament uh, that, or the armor, if you will, that God has provided for us spiritually, uh, the armor that the typical Roman soldier would, would wear. Now, much more could be said about uh, Paul's relationship with the church at Ephesus. He, we know he spent a lot of time there, um, made at least three trips, uh, spent over two years there uh, teaching and preaching. And, and so we could say a lot about his time in Ephesus and his familiarity with, with Ephesus. Um, however, we're going to focus on our lesson text and actually try to understand uh, a little better uh, how God intends for the protection uh, that he's provided, uh, the armor that he's provided, that he intends for all of us to wear, and he's provided it for all of us. Now, whether we have apprehended it, and that is if we have put it on or not, is something that we want to examine ourselves to determine as we go through this lesson today. So we're going to... Um, take a passage at a time or a division of the quarterly lesson at a time. Uh, we'll read uh, the verses in the division and then we'll back up and we'll have some verse by verse uh, discussion. So I'm going to read from the NIV, I'm sorry, from the KJV and uh, also the NIV as necessary for greater clarity. So beginning with the first division, which is entitled, Know Your Enemy, and that's covered between Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. We read verses 10 to 12. Um, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So let's back up again to verse 10, which reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So let's back up again to verse 10, which reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And we're going to try to be um, uh, quicker, if you will, uh, in our discussion today. Uh, I know sometimes I can get a bit uh, in the weeds or long-winded, but uh, hopefully it's for our, our greater understanding. Let's deal with this finally. Uh, Paul is uh, making a final point in uh, his instruction. Well, what has he done so far? Well, we know, as I said, uh, he's uh, dealt with doctrine in the first three chapters. And in the last three, he's dealt with uh, principles, I mean, uh, how to 
actually uh, live out, if you will, the doctrinal principles that he's taught. And, and very briefly, if you want, you can jot uh, these down. Uh, uh, the last three chapters uh, of Ephesians focus on ways that true faith in Christ expresses itself in daily living. And this includes pursuing unity among believers. That's covered between chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Speaking truthfully and dealing with people honestly that's covered uh, in chapter 4, verse 25, and verse 28. Extending forgiveness, chapter 4, verse 32. Avoiding sexual sin, that's covered in chapter 5, verse 3. Being a good spouse and parent, that's covered between chapter 5, verses 22 and 33, and chapter 6, verse 4 and demonstrating a strong worth work ethic and that's covered between chapter 6 verse verse 5 to 9 verses 5 to 9 and these uh one of the commentators says imperatives are not always easy to carry out so paul reminded the readers of the true source of power to be able to do so to live out these principles um that he taught in earlier chapters and that is the Lord he is the source of the power that we need to live out the biblical the godly principles that he uh, has uh, taught uh, that Paul has taught in this epistle and 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 the Lord Jesus taught himself okay so that power that comes from God so he says he, he, he says, take, he said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That means that we have a choice to avail ourselves to this strength, to this power. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, we need to understand something. Um, we, we, we have no power uh, certainly when it comes to uh, uh, resisting or combating spiritual forces, we need to understand that. And the Lord said, without uh, him, we can do nothing. And we, do, we need to understand, left to our own devices, uh, we can't do anything or to become what God wants us to be. So we have to rely, avail ourselves to the power of God through his spirit and rely on it consistently uh, to enable uh, to be able to live as God would have us to to combat the evil forces the spiritual forces to resist the spiritual forces most of our efforts are not offensive as we'll see as we get as we get further into the lesson but defensive we are to stand Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I'm going to read that from the NIV, which, uh, which reads, put on the full armor of God so that you may, so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Okay. Now, when it says put on, it means to not just put on for the duration that we're under some trial or temptation, if you will, but to keep on. It means to put on, make this a permanent permanent part of our attire. Make, make, make it our permanent attire. Uh, why? Because we don't know when or where or in what fashion uh, the schemes, uh, the wiles of the devils will attack us. I believe it's 2 Corinthians 2.11 says we're not ignorant of his devices or we're not to be ignorant of his schemes or his uh, enticements or his, uh, his, his traps. But we, are, but we are to be vigilant in uh, standing in 
the armor that God has provided, the whole armor that God has provided for us. And Paul, while Paul is going to be um, using uh, symbolically uh, the armor that uh, a Roman, typical Roman soldier would wear, uh, what he is covering is the complete uh, armor that we are to have, spiritual armor that we are to have to resist the devil and actually as necessary to go on offense against his schemes, against his devices. So putting on the whole armor of God thoroughly equips us to do that. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now the NIV says, with reference to high places, the heavenly realm, we know that um, there are um, the high places are referred to uh, in various places in the Bible uh, as uh, the the heaven, which is the, the immediate first heaven, and Paul actually really details this uh, more fully in Second Corinthians, which is really the atmosphere above us. The second heaven, which is uh, the space or outer space, if you will, and then the third heaven, which is the abode of God. And, and both commentators seem to suggest that uh, the spiritual forces, if you will, uh, the uh, forces. Uh, or someplace in the heavenly realm. They're not underneath the earth, uh, not in hell yet, as it, as it were, uh, but they're operating in the spiritual, uh, in, in a uh, realm in the high or heavenly abode. Uh, I happen to think that this could also uh, be a reference to high places in terms of authorities uh, on earth, uh, human authorities, if you will, on earth. Let's understand that Satan uh, works through human instrumentality. He works through people. He works through organizations. He works through uh, 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 what the, the natural world. He's the prince of the power of the air to accomplish his purposes. So, so we need to understand that we're not uh, necessarily just dealing with spiritual forces. Satan being the head of them. We're talking about demonic forces uh, in the dark world, if you will, the, um, the world that is in opposition, the spiritual forces that are in opposition to God, that are in darkness, not in light, even though Satan, we know, can appear as an angel of light. We're talking about those uh, forces that actually are influencing the natural world, people, and organizations that uh, are working against the purposes of God and against his people. And Ephesians 2, 2 refers to Satan as the, as the prince of the power of the air. I mentioned that a minute ago, John. Uh, and, and this speaks of his uh, pervasiveness. I mean, he uh, how pervasive he is uh, as, as air is in our atmosphere. So we, we need to understand that while, as I, as I mentioned, uh, Satan and his, um, uh, his minions uh, influence flesh and blood people, that is, we are not actually wrestling against flesh and blood uh, in our churches, in our homes, uh, in our family relationships. Uh, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood we are wrestling against the power that is influencing them the demonic power the evil power that is influencing them to do what is contrary to god's will so people are not our true adversaries but satan and his satan and his minions are and satan and his minions are and they can challenge us in various ways um, threats persecutions ridicule rejection um, temptation uh, to join in their sins or sinful uh, ways um, and, and again this 
this is pervasive in our society today. Uh, 50 years ago, we couldn't have imagined the evil that is so pervasive in our society today when uh, young children are being sexualized, when uh, homosexuality and transsexuality are, are, are becoming um, forced, is be being forced on us as if it were normal. And, uh, you know, you can't watch uh, a television program these days without seeing a, a women kissing or men kissing or in sexual uh, situations. It, it's, it's so pervasive now that uh, it, if we're not guarded, if we don't have the full armor of God, uh, we can be um, uh, affected. We can be affected in adverse ways uh, and fall victim, if you will, to these assaults against the will of God. So let's move into our second division, which is entitled use use the proper tools and that's covered between Ephesians 6 verses 13 and 18 again I'll read from the KJV uh, and it reads wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day and having done all to stand Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So let's back up to verse 13. And again it reads, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, this is a restatement of what Paul already said in verse 11, uh, and it's for emphasis. He's emphasizing its importance. He's saying, you know, basically because we, we cannot predict, as I said, when, where, or how the enemy will strike, we must be dressed and ready for conflict at any moment. And uh, uh, he's saying that this preparation repeated we need to put this armor on every day and and why so that we may be able to withstand uh, having done all I, I remember um, when my grandmother was uh, convinced that the Lord was calling her she was she was ill she'd had a number of strokes uh, praying with her and reading the Bible to her and and I this was a passage that I, I read to her uh, nightly just having done all she had lived a faithful life uh, the Lord had used her in many ways um, uh, even to perform miracles believe it or not um, and uh, and I just tried to comfort her um, with the fact that she had this armor available to her and while Satan was attacking her body or allowing her perhaps to have uh, I don't know. She, she, she seemed strong in her faith to the end, but I know in some situations like that, people question their faith and question whether it's all been um, worth uh, the struggle. The Christian walk has been worth the struggle, but I, I encouraged her to just stand in the armor of God uh, as Satan no doubt attempted to assault her. But anyway, what this is saying is, that we are to we, we have no strength of our own uh, we can uh, we only way we can withstand the assaults of Satan whatever they are doubt temptation to sin uh, whatever uh, we have no power to resist him unless we stand in this full armor of God and it says in the evil day withstand in the evil day again having done all um, to stand having done all of God's will we, we, we still need to be vigilant 
uh, because Satan again can attack us at any time and in any way. Now this evil day can refer to the end time. Uh, we know when uh, just before the Lord comes and destroys all of his enemies, uh, but it can also but both the commentators suggest that we've been in the evil day since uh, uh, since Christ's sacrifice uh, gave his life uh, and and uh, we are uh, facing an evil day whenever we are subjected to uh, great temptation uh, or great affliction um, when there is great spiritual conflict one of the commentators says when it's most severe uh, that's an evil day so we want to again sometimes uh, Satan attack, attacks rather with greater ferocity than, than other times uh, and we want to be prepared whatever uh, the uh, force if you will of the attack of Satan Verse 14a, he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about. That is, having your waist. The NIV says, Stand therefore, or stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. It goes on in part B to say, With the breastplate of righteousness in place. But let's focus on this belt of truth around your waist we know that john 14 6 in john 14 6 the lord declares that he is the way the truth and the life no one comes to him um, comes to god but through him now uh, this truth is a right understanding of reality it is foundational it is a foundational gift of god this truth first informs us of our spiritual depravity, of the fact that uh, we are lost, the fact that uh, we are separated from God, and then informs us of how to be uh, to be saved, to be reconciled with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So that is foundational. Now the belt, or what was used to gird the loins uh, of the Roman soldier with what was used to pull all the loose ends of his garments together and also used for attachment of the remaining armor, the breastplate, uh, and, and uh, of course, to prepare him uh, for to be, to be able to move quickly without the entanglement of any loose uh, garments or uh, dangling garment uh, pieces. Uh, and and we could we could even in short say that the truth is the gospel. I mean, the gospel shows us shows us our true selves. It shows us that we're rebels against God. One of the commentators says, in desperate need of His mercy. And so again, as I said, it is foundational before we can uh, prepare ourselves to defend ourselves against again the schemes, the attacks, the assaults of Satan. We first must know the Lord as our Savior. We first must have recognized and accepted that foundational truth. Part B says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, what did the breastplate do for the Roman soldier? Well, it protected the vital organs uh, necessary for life or to sustain life. It was typically a, a thick leather, made of thick le leather or metal. And it was, um, again, it was uh, a defense. It was a uh, an element or ornament of, of defense to protect against frontal assaults. And Paul connected this, uh, this piece of the equipment, if you will, with righteousness. Okay, it, it really speaks of the quality of, of living correctly in God's eyes. Uh, we protect ourselves from Satan's assault by living rightly with the health of the spirit. When it says the breastplate of righteousness, and we hear, we read righteousness a lot throughout the Bible. What does that mean? It means doing what's right. It means being right in the sight of God, not in the sight of man, but in the sight of God. And so that's what 
He is having it, in, it, it as part of our core righteousness, being right to the core, not just when men can see you, but being right in all of your doings. And our right or righteous character really serves as a defense against the temptations of Satan, temptations of any kind of Satan. Let's move on to verse 15, which says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. From the NIV, it, say, it reads, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, this this uh, <clears throat> NIV translation is a little better translation of this verse um, when it talks about having our feet fitted or shod, uh, having on the proper footwear, if you will, for travel. Uh, it is uh, the, the King James Version is a little uh, confusing in that it says with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, that word of the gospel of peace could better be translated that results from the gospel of peace. And that's kind of what uh, the NIV uh, translation uh, communicates. It says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So what are we talking about here? Um, it is the gospel of itself that prepares our feet for the day of spiritual battle the gospel the truth that we talked about uh the good news okay that uh, uh despite the fact that we have been sinners uh our sins have been paid for by christ and again we have been reconciled to god through christ that is the gospel that the truth that prepares us for uh, for this spiritual battle, if you will. Now, when we speak of uh, peace, uh, we need to understand uh, the, uh, the meaning of the word in this context. Uh, now, Rome had, uh, the Roman Empire had what they claimed to be peace uh, uh, with all of its, its subjects, all the territories and uh, peoples that had conquered called the Pax Romana, which really um, was just a, a cessation of hostility. Uh, they were not uh, forcefully uh, sub attacking them, and so there was a peace that allowing them to uh, to basically govern themselves to some extent uh, and to live peaceably within the Roman Empire. Well, the peace that we're talking about. Uh, Shalom is not just a cessation or a, a, an ab absence of hostilities or cessation of violence, but it is a it's a, it's a wholeness. It's a well-being. Uh, it means um, it means a, a wholesomeness. So that that is the peace that uh, we're talking about in this verse. Having your feet shot with the good news, the gospel of this peace that the Lord gives us. Let's move on to verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, I have not been uh, describing uh, the, uh, the elements of the armor uh, I, I could have mentioned that uh, the sandals that the Roman soldiers wore were had thick level leather soles with with some nails in them for traction. Uh, the shield that's spoken of now, there were two types of shields uh, that the Roman soldier used for hand to hand combat. The shoulder used a small, typically round shield that they could hold with one forearm. Uh, and then wield a, a short sword with the other hand. Uh, the shield that's being uh, referred to in this verse, verse 16, is a larger shield. Uh, some have called it a door-sized shield, but it was typically about 
two uh, to two and a half feet uh, by four feet or so high, uh, and it was semi-cylindrical, it was curved, if you will, uh, and it was one used to shield the entire body. And uh, some of you uh, have seen uh, uh, ancient warfare, uh, movies involving ancient warfare where Roman soldiers uh, actually stand together with these shields uh, end to end or edge to edge and then some put uh, them over the top of them and they actually form this uh, this barrier that retards arrows even flaming arrows that are shot at a whole cohort of soldiers and uh, the, the shields were, were typically uh, wood with thick leather on the on top of them and they actually were able to not only uh, prevent the arrows from penetrating them but they actually quench fiery uh, arrows and those fiery arrows uh, symbol uh, actually are symbols of what Satan attacks us with and if we you, you can imagine if we don't have a shield that can stop those arrows what's going to happen we're going to get hit by those fer fiery arrows which physically would do tremendous damage to a body spiritually those fiery arrows can do great damage to us as well so what what did that shield symbolize for us it, it symbolizes our faith our faith is the protective shield and this faith is more than um, just a mere agreement um, to a creed or a statement about Jesus um, or who Jesus is uh, it, it's 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 more than how we were uh, raised uh, it's it's a life it's a trusting commitment of our lives to the truth of, of, of that statement of the gospel it is it is trusting our lives placing our lives in God's almighty hands to provide protection to provide direction to provide everything that we stand in need of uh to uh and and, and, and it's obedience you know um, uh faith uh without works is dead james says you know so we demonstrate genuine faith through good works okay which god has prepared for us or prepared us to do okay so these fiery darts again uh, indicate temptations, uh, difficulties, uh, anything that Satan can throw at us to get us uh, to do contrary to God's will, to to weaken our faith, if you will. Uh, and so um, you can imagine now one person uh, having protection against darts or arrows that are fired directly at him. But if someone were standing to the side, they could probably penetrate them. And, and so this, <clears throat> if you, again, remember how the soldiers worked together to shield the entire company, uh, that suggests that the Christians working together, relying on each other, praying for each other, standing together, are stronger than Christians standing individually. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some we're told in Hebrews. But uh, we are uh, to help each other. We are to reinforce each other. We are to strengthen each other. And, and, and again, with our shields end to end, uh, we are formidable resistance to the attacks of Satan. And I'm, I'm talking about not just individual, but organizational, institutional attacks of Satan. There are attacks on the church today and our religious freedom, and there will be, and those attacks will be intensified. Uh, some of you may know that the Senate or a committee, subcommittee of the Senate approved this uh, uh, freedom of marriage or whatever. Uh, they're trying to uh, codify uh, the right of, of homosexuals and I, I'm not intending to harp on that there are all kinds of sins being forced it on the Christian community but it's going to be something that is going to affect the church because if if you don't uh, not only uh, accept uh, uh, and embrace, accept the lifestyle of those that are living contrary to God's will 
Uh, they want you to embrace it. Uh, eventually, uh, I believe that pastors will be required to marry them, uh, even though they're saying that they will be protected from that. But it's all going, uh, as the Bible predicts, it says evil men will grow worse and worse. But as an organization, as an organism, the church, we can resist more effectively uh, works uh, even through our government uh, than we can individual works of Satan through our government uh, than we can individually. And I'm not trying to get political here, but we know that uh, Satan is working in all in all sectors in the church. He's working in uh, politics. Uh, he's working in all sectors of our lives, which is again why he's the prince of the power of the air. Let's move on to verse 17, which reads. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let's look at part A and take the helmet of salvation. Now, um, let's talk about what, what is salvation, first of all. Uh, it, it's not just an assurance of life after death, after this physical uh, life, if you will, or after our physical death. But salvation is deliverance. It's deliverance from the penalty of sin, of course, and that is eternal separation from God. Uh, it's deliverance from the power of sin, and that's what we're talking about right now in this life, which we can have through the aid of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual armaments that God has provided for us or armor that God has provided for us. And then it is ultimately the deliverance from the very presence of sin, which is future tense, and that we are going to receive new bodies like unto the Lord's glorified body, uh, and we'll be called out of this sin-sick world. Now, um, but this, this helmet symbolizes the salvation. He says the helmet of salvation, and the NIV reads take the helmet of salvation just as you know i mean the j the kjv does and 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 what 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 was the roman helmet intended to do okay well it was intended to protect uh the certainly the the head of the soldier but it also uh, was uh, fashioned to declare uh, the, the soldier's nationality uh, vivid and vividly. They had uh, certain ornaments on the, the helmet that let you know whose army they were serving in. Now, I happen to agree with one of the commentators. Uh, the spiritual helmet is to protect our minds. Uh, we want to protect our minds at all times. Um, and uh, we want to uh, to be vigilant to to fill our minds with those good, those those pleasant, those things that are praiseworthy. Uh, spoken of in Ephesians uh, chapter four, I believe, verse ten or nine and ten. We want to fill our minds with the truth of God's word and with uh, His instruction, which means we need to study. We need to study and meditate daily uh, so that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of false doctrine which Satan uh, produces or, or Satan uh, tries to uh, affect us with. Uh, but also I believe that uh, what uh, one of the other the, the other commentator says that it should be uh, clear as to whose army we're serving in. We're serving in the Lord's Army. So if there's some type of insignia uh, on that helmet that lets us know that we're not in uh, the emperor's army, but we're in the army of the Lord Jesus, uh, so much the better. Part B of 17 says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now he tells you what this sword symbolizes. We know that the sword was the only offensive weapon, if you will, or part of the armor. Also, it could be used for defense, but it was the only uh, 
implement if you, of the armor that could be used for offense and defense. And he tells you that it is the word of God. And the Lord Jesus tells you, the, or I should say Revelation tells us that uh, the Lord is going to destroy all of his enemies at his return with the sword that shall proceed out of it, not the double-edged sword, which meant it's going to cut to and going and coming. We know that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, again, dividing asunder bone from marrow. And we know that the, the word has great power uh, to defend and to uh, go on offense against the the evils that are affecting the work of the Lord. Now we need to be careful now. The sword is not intended to <clears throat> to um, to harm the lost uh, and the hopeless. Uh, we can beat people down with the word and uh, and that's not the approach we want to take when we're uh, dealing with the lost and the hopeless. We want to approach them with love, with the love of Christ. Uh, and again, use the, the sword only when necessary, when aggression is necessary to prevent uh, Satan's work from harming uh, a believer. So, or believer. So, what do I, what do I mean by that? I mean, I mean, we 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 defend ourselves and we go on offense with the Word of God. We don't uh, refer to our own authority or our own uh, sense of what's right or what's wrong in any type of uh, conflict. Uh, we refer to the Word of God. Uh, we are doing what we do because the Word of God. Uh, uh, instructs us to do that so we use the word of god we know that when jesus was tempted uh jesus defended himself with the word of god and we know that every time he took a passage from deuteronomy it is written and so we are to again act on the authority of god's word uh in defending and as i said in going on offense as needed so finally we're going to move into verse um 18 and it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, uh, while we are fully uh, equipped with the armor of God, okay, as uh, we've discussed in the last several verses, and we're, and we, we continue to wear this armor. I mean, we put this armor on every day. We wear this armor. This it's apparent. It's 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 a, it's a standard outfit for us. We are to pray. We are to pray always. He says, and he he goes on and says, with all prayer, all kinds of prayer, and supplication. What is supplication? Supplication is a specific request. We don't. Just pray, Lord, bless your church. Uh, we don't just pr we pray specifically for specific things um, that either the Lord places on our heart or that we become aware of uh, by some means uh, that necessitates prayer, where there is a need for prayer. Certainly, this includes intercessory prayer for others, and it's not talking in this context about praying for uh, our own personal needs, unless we're praying for strength. Uh, spiritual strength and uh, we're praying for something in the spiritual realm for ourselves not talking about praying for our material needs necessarily but it's praying for uh, in the in for for our ability to resist evil the evil that Satan would perpetrate on his people and us individually and and it says praying in the spirit Okay, so what what does that mean? It means um, it, it does it doesn't mean that you know we're we're speaking in tongues or in some mystical or static language anything like that, but we are relying on the Spirit uh, to guide our prayers uh, and also to be the messenger of our prayers uh, to God. You know, uh, we know that the Spirit uh, helps. Uh, the understanding of our prayers when we can do 
nothing but groan. Okay, the Spirit understands what it is that we're trying to communicate. So we want uh, the Spirit to guide, to inform our prayer. What are we to pray for, pray for specifically? And then, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, uh, we want the, the, the Holy Spirit to be a part of communicating. And we know that the Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. So we are praying to the Father uh, through the Spirit, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and and again, we, the, the most effective prayers, uh, you've been told, I'm sure, originate in heaven and return to heaven. So we want, again, not to pray uh, for the wrong things. We want to be guided in our prayers uh, by the Spirit for the right things. And why do we pray uh, to God for those things that we know God knows that we need? Because he told us to. He knows what we need, but he told us to pray for them anyway and to depend on him, to trust him for those things. And he goes on and says, watching thereunto with all perseverance, uh, and supplication again that's a specific request for all saints so what's he saying here and and and, and from the N, uh, niv it says with this in mind the, the, the last part of that verse is with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the lord's people okay so uh we're to pray all kinds of prayers uh as the Spirit leads us in the Spirit, okay? And we're to pray, he's talking about intercessory prayer for all God's people. We're to be alert. Alert to what? The need for prayer. Where prayer is needed. What prayer is needed for. And then offer those prayers as we become aware through our alertness, our perpetual alertness, our perseverance, uh, we are to pray all kinds of prayers for all the Lord's people. So I hope we have uh, gotten a little better understanding of this passage. Um, I'm going to just read a, a few statements in conclusion from one of the commentators. And he says, we always feel the tension of living in a world battered by evil forces. We feel the pressure that the forces of evil press on us. It is easy and natural to feel weak when it seems that darkness surrounds us. And that is the truth. Sometimes we can feel weak because it seems like the whole world is working for Satan. And in point of fact, the system, the world system is. But he goes on to say, but by God's provision, we are strong. That's something that we have to realize and we have to apprehend the strength. There are no flaws in his armor, no gaps in the protection it supplies. Reviewing all that God has provided, we have renewed strength and stand firm in every circumstance. Or we can. Now, I'm going to challenge you all and myself as well. To daily examine ourselves to see if we have the full armor of God on to protect ourselves from the, uh, the fiery darts of the wicked, to protect our minds, uh, to have the peace of the gospel, uh, to be prepared to defend uh, the, the, the gospel uh, and, and God's people. Uh, we want to just examine ourselves on a daily basis to see if we are indeed taking advantage of the strength that God provides us through his armor. So we, again, we pray that uh, this has been a blessing to you. We ask, your, we ask God's blessings on all the hearers and all the families represented here. And we pray that you've had a glorious Thanksgiving and we thank God uh, for this opportunity as always. We pray in his name. Amen.